Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and today we are here with Lars, and he is going to enlighten us about timing relationships, marriage, using different techniques. He will be using Hellenistic astrology. Am I right? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, more or less Hellenistic Persian. Yes, so welcome to Exotic Astrology. This is the first time uh, he's here, and we recently did another video together, I guess. And yeah, we did two two videos, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did that one, uh, the game show one too. Yeah, so fun. this is the first time he's there. In, yeah. He has been here individually, and he also has a YouTube channel, which you can find in the description below. So you can please go and subscribe there, and you also do readings. So you have a website, I guess. I do, yeah, uh, both astrology and tarot card readings, and I've just recently posted um, videos for tarot readings for all 12 signs for this month of December and I plan to do that okay. each month. Okay, so today he will enlighten us about timing relationships using various other techniques, some things which are also there in the Yavan Jatak and using Sahams which are points about which he will explain and mm -hmm. yeah. he might uh, speak on tarot and some other techniques also and we will upload this in parts because uh, then the videos are like specific to topics so around 15-20 minutes each video will be alright. So uh, if you watch this, then make sure that you watch the other parts also. Okay, so welcome and the stage is all yours. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for having me here. I'm excited to be here and I love to nerd out about this stuff with other astrologers. So yeah, let's just jump right into it. Um, so yeah, one of, the, one of the techniques that I have found that seems to work really well for delineating um, marriage very like in general, you know, is um, this technique that we find in the book by uh, Ptolemy, who was uh, basically an astrologer and astronomer in Alexandria, Egypt, in I think like uh, first, second century, maybe AD. And so uh, Ptolemy's main text is called Tetra Biblos, which means four books. And it's, it's just a very good, concise book on astrology. There's, there's gems there that I haven't found anywhere else. And so it's just one of those like highly prized little texts. And I think you can probably find it online even for free. But the, the technique seems to appear first with him, and then we find it replicated in a lot of Persian authors. And so it's basically pretty simple. Like if you're looking at, um, you know, let's say you're looking at uh, your average woman's chart, you're going to look at the, hus uh, the husband through the sun. And if you're looking at the average man's chart, you're going to look at the wife through the moon. I say average because, um, you know, they weren't back back then when this book was written, they people didn't marry um, in a homosexual manner. You know, there was homosexuality and stuff, but people didn't marry that way. So these techniques may have to be a little modified for the modern day where there's same sex marriage. But so for now, I'll just talk about it from a general standpoint. And so it's really, yeah, it's really simple. So like if, uh, if I'm looking at a, a woman's chart, let's say, uh, and most of my clients tend to be women for some reason. So, you know, and they're, they're, you know people always want to know about marriage and relationship, of course. So the, one of the first things I will do is I will just find their son and I will just look and see what planets are aspecting it. And the aspects that I use are the Tajika aspects, basically, which is the conjunction, sextals, trines, squares, and oppositions. And um, and there's some special some special rules about this as well. Um, and it works. It seems to work in both sidereal and tropical. I've I've tested it in both a bit, and um, it just works wonderfully, no matter what zodiac you're using. I think so. The idea is that uh, any any planets aspecting the sun, each of them will show a different partner. And some of those partners are people the person might marry, right? But some of them are people the person might just date or be associated with. And how are you gonna how are you gonna tell that? You know, how are you gonna tell if they're gonna marry that person or not? That's a little bit more difficult to do. And that requires looking at a lot of other factors like the seventh house and its Lord and Venus. And then also the Sahams or the, what are called the, the lots in Hellenistic. And they're also called Arabic parts later on. Those are all the same thing though. They're different names for the same thing. Those are mathematical points that deal with specific topics of life. So 
we actually in the Hellenistic tradition have three, maybe four different ways of calculating a Saham for marriage. <laughs> and they each kind of do something different based on the planets that are involved in the calculation. So you can get quite complex with this stuff. Um, but this simple technique will at least give you a lot of insight uh, into some of the people the person might marry or have some kind of romantic relationship with. And so, you know, it's, again, like if, um, if Jupiter is aspecting that sun, right, then you just say, okay, you're going to have uh, a relationship with a Jupiterian type person. And then you, you know, check its dignity and its house placement and all that stuff, just like you would for any other technique. And you can say, you know, what is this Jupiter person going to be like? If it's a well-placed Jupiter, that might be a very like wealthy person that the person's marrying. You know, that might be a, um, a very jovial, optimistic person, or it might be a very priestly kind of, um, you know, Brahmanical kind of person, like somebody who studies a lot and is very religious. And that's all going to depend on, on really the house placement, you know, like Jupiter in the ninth, would be maybe the more religious type person, whereas Jupiter in the 10th might be more of like a a hardworking businessman type person or something like that, and so on and so forth, just the regular techniques of astrology. But yeah, here's where the the technique gets kind of interesting, is that there's like all these, there's all these other ways to, to like, I don't know, to just like figure out what what is also going to transpire in the marriage as well. Like you can, you can get pretty crazy with it. So, um, one way we do that is with, uh, just the basic aspects. Like if the planet is opposing the sun and the planet is retrograde at the same time, that's going to put some strain on that partnership naturally, you know? Um, and actually have a, a good example of this, uh, in a, in a friend's chart, this, this person was, um, I won't, you know, I won't reveal too much about the chart for privacy purposes, but the, the person was having uh, uh, Saturn uh, squaring their sun, and the chart was a night chart, meaning they were born at night. And in the Hellenistic tradition, uh, night charts, Saturn is a little bit more unwieldy, a little bit more challenging to deal with. But the sun was also in a sign ruled by Saturn. So there was what you call reception, where Saturn, even though he's giving a hard aspect to that sun, he's also receiving the sun, meaning that um, meaning that Saturn sun things will generally work out, even though there will there will be friction. And um, other things, you know, Saturn also was like ruling the seventh house. Saturn was in a you know a couple other things about him, he, you know, um, that were generally auspicious and determining him toward marriage, right? There was like several things, but this person was like married for like 40 something years with this situation. And in their, in their spouse's chart, their husband's chart, Saturn was extremely prominent. I think Saturn was in like the fourth house aspecting the ascendant pretty powerfully, you know? So their, their partner was very Saturnic in many ways. And I was even able to deduce that he was uh, an atheist from the way he was positioned, you know? So is your husband an atheist? Yes. And um, so this Saturn clearly showed that marriage and it showed it early on as well because of like several other factors that would probably require a whole video to go into. But one of the basic things you can do to determine if it'll be earlier in life or later in life will be to see if the planet in aspect is going to rise over the horizon before the sun or after the sun. That, that's important because what, hap- what, what happens is, um, and it's the same thing if that planet is aspecting the moon in a man's chart, you still look at this relative to the sun. Because if the planet rises before the sun rises on the day that person was born, then that planet is like appearing ahead of the sun. It's like, it's like they're making an appearance early, right, in the, in the day, in the morning, at the beginning of life, more towards the beginning. But if they're, if they're, set, if they're rising after the sun, then you're only going to see them when the sun sets and they're going to appear at the end of the day, so later in life. And so you can sort of discern... Um, 
you have to check it against other techniques, but it's a very basic and effective way to discern if that relationship will be earlier or later. But then if that relationship um, comes, let's say it's, it's occidental, meaning rising after the sun. So we'll see it at night uh, when the sun sets. If that relationship does happen to, to occur earlier because of other things that weighing in, then that relationship may be a little bit more, um, a little bit more dysfunctional in a way, if you can believe that at least when it's Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. Um, Venus and Mercury seem to do better when they're, um, when, they're, when they're rising after the sun because they're faster. They're actually faster in their speed. So that's kind of, again, it's, like, it's kind of another tangent. There's like a lot here to this technique, but that's sort of the basic overview of it. And then um, I have a couple other things I can say too, but did you have any questions or did you want to, yeah, one Comment. thing I want to ask, uh, what about aspects? Can you throw some light on that? Yeah, um, you mean on the um, the Tajika style aspects? Yeah, because many people are not familiar with this sex style and other things. Oh, okay, yeah. So the idea in the Tajika system, which is based on the Persian and Hellenistic system, is that each planet will cast basically an aspect of 60 degrees to signs that are um, the third and the 11th sign from it. And that's a constructive aspect. And this is all based off geometry. So like the sextal I'm talking about, it's a six sided figure, which is a very harmonious shape in nature. It's a honeycomb, like, like in a beehive or whatever. So very strong, harmonious shape. So it's cooperative. Then you have the squares of 90 degrees, right? To the signs fourth and 10th from that other sign. And so those are more challenging because the square is geometrically an unstable shape in architecture and in nature and stuff. Then you have the trines, which are to the houses five and nine from the planet's position. And those are um, very, very, very stable and cooperative, similar to Jupiter, right? Because again, the, the, the equilateral triangle, very stable shape, it's you used in texture right at like corners where there's beams you'll make a corner and make the make it into a triangle to distribute the, the weight right and then uh, the last major aspect is the opposition which is just 180 degrees the sign exactly opposite that sign and that's again kind of challenging because it's a division you're cutting in half um, and then the conjunction is uh, is the same also in uh, Jyotish right it's um what is it called in Sanskrit? Do you know? I can't remember. <laughs> Conjunct conjunctions in general? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a nice name for it in Sanskrit, isn't there? U what? Yuti. Yuti, yeah. Yuti, that's it. Right. So the conjunction is not considered an aspect. It's just considered like a union of the, the planets involved. You know, it's, it's, sort of, um, it's sort of like they almost become one thing in a sense. And so that's the basic idea with those aspects. And then the closer they are by degree, right? Their, their whole sign, meaning just the whole signs, like Aries will always have a whole sign connection trying to Leo and Sagittarius, right? But the closer the degrees, the more powerful the aspect. And usually within about three degrees is the most powerful. And so that's where you can be more certain that these kinds of things will take place. Um, Ptolemy also says that like with regard to the sun, that you generally want to ignore planets that are combust, meaning like really close to the sun within about eight or nine degrees, right? Um, I, I don't know yet if I agree with that or not. I haven't... Um, haven't found enough examples to test if that's really accurate. Yeah. Regarding that only, I wanted to ask, suppose in a lady's chart, for example, sun is a conjunct Jupiter, suppose. Right. So then, or in another case that Jupiter is in the seventh house from sun, for example. Right. So in the second case, it is aspecting. And in the first case, it is conjunct. So, does that rule still apply uh, for the conjunction that the person, the people she might meet are like Jupiterian people? 
I, I think it does. Um, and one way to test that it would be to ask about the person's father and what their father's like, because the son is also the father, of course. And so this, this technique implies that, you know, our father influences the type of man we marry if we're a woman and the moon influences the type of woman we marry if we're a man, because it's also our, our, our father and mother. And so, um, there are some mitigating conditions to combustion, for example, that can make the combustion um, less harmful to the planet. Like if the planet is in its own sign or exaltation, uh, or if the planet is with the sun combust in Leo or Aries where the sun is, is powerful and so receives those planets into its own power basically. But what, what Ptolemy generally says is, uh, he, you know, he seems to say, or either him or some later authors who use this technique seem to say that if the planets combust, you, you just kind of ignore it. But if it's in the same sign with the sun, but it's not combust, then you don't ignore it. You definitely take it into account for this technique. And further in that direction, like if he also says that if the sun or moon are in like a fixed sign, it will mean only one marriage unless there's another planet also in that same sign, but not, again, not combust in, in the case of the sun. So that can be a thing for one marriage, but once again, you gotta look and see if a lot of marriage factors are also in fixed signs, because then you'll know more certainly if it's one marriage or more. Cardinal signs can signify like either multiple marriages or like a lot of, um, like a lot of association with the uh, members of the opposite sex. So it could mean a lot of, uh, a lot of sex. It could mean a lot of short lived relationships, right? Um, that doesn't mean it's, that doesn't mean marriage is hopeless. It just means that there's going to be that theme there for the person and then dual signs, right? The dual Rashis, they will signify two marriages and then any, any planets aspecting them will, uh, or or in the same sign with them and not combust again can signify an additional marriage um and it's a unique case for the um the water signs because the watery rashis are all very prolific so when it comes to childbirth significators if jupiter the fifth lord or whatever is in water signs it can mean a lot more children and the same for marriage if you've got marriage stuff in those watery signs it can mean a lot more um, you know, partnerships or marriages or sexual activity. And with, you know, Pisces, it's a dual sign, but it's watery. So kind of by extension, it can mean, um, it can mean more associating with other, you know, partners, even if it's only two marriages, depending on, but you should also, um, you should also check the palm too. Um, if you know about palmistry, because like there's, um, there's like little lines that, that are like right yeah, here. I think you know? we, can, we can do this palmist in the next session. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I just mean like it's a real quick thing to check against okay. the chart, yeah, right? Yeah. So like you just glance at that real quick, see if they have okay. marriage lines. Where, where do they see that? Uh, the marriage lines are like under the pinky, basically. Your and I don't... And is not very visible. You can just I don't, yeah, I don't think... Okay. They're, they're right there, like on my palm. So they kind of, they're kind of faint, uh, in the picture, but, but if you know about palmistry, this, these techniques are great to juxtapose with palmistry, you know, because it, it'll, you can see more concretely. Although to be honest, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it just doesn't even, even work because I was uh, looking at this woman's palm recently and I couldn't find any marriage lines, but I looked at her chart and I said, well, it looks like possibly uh, two or possibly more than uh, more than one marriage. And she told me that, she, uh, cause I knew she was recently divorced, but she told me she was married before that. And I was just basing that purely off the fact that her son was in, um, her son was in Pisces. So a dual sign, right? So I found out that yes, she had already been married twice and that, um, using Chandra Lagna, cause I didn't have her time. Um, the seventh house was also a, uh, it was Gemini. So another dual sign. And, um, and the moon was in, yeah, Sagittarius. So a lot of dual sign stuff going on for that person. So, 
that's kind of the basic, basic overview of the technique. And it gets more and more wild and crazy as you start to add in the Sahams and Venus and the seventh Lord and seventh house and, you know, all that good stuff. So, Yes, we'll, we'll discuss all of them in the next sessions. Great. All right, so everybody stay tuned. Okay.